Creek a week ago in the water and I looked up on the bank and there was a parade of elderly gentlemen coming by on the bank and every single one of them had a shovel and a screen in their hand. And they were out in the middle of nowhere and they'd been hiking for about a mile. It's about 12 of them and they were all looking for what was in that bag. Wow. And whoever has the big tooth, just somebody hand that back to me at the end. Pass it, I gave him back. Thanks so much. Trust the pastor. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we call you to be with us this, this day, Lord. We ask that your spirit and your angels would be in this place. Amen. And Lord, we pray that you will teach us this morning, that you will edify each one of us, and that you will bless us. Father, we are going to open up your word, and we pray that you will teach us from the word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I um, deliberated, uh, and at the time that the bulletin was put together, uh, I sort of had a different thought in mind, and um, there's something else on my heart this morning, uh, to some extent, and so I'm going to start with that. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that no man in all the world can change the truth. Yeah. Only One can only look for the truth, find it, and serve it. The truth is in all places, and Jesus said, thy word is truth. So there is such a thing as truth. And the following story of a woman applying to a prestigious university uh, is told. And she got the application for the university, she fulfilled the criteria, and then she came to a question on the form. And it said, are you a leader? And she looked at the question and she thought to herself, and because she was a truthful and conscientious person, she checked, she wrote, no I am not. And she handed her application in, put it in the mail, sent it in, and she thought to herself, uh, I'll be rejected. <clears throat> to her surprise, she got a letter from the college, Dear Applicant, a study of the application forms revealed that this year our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it imperative that they have at least one follower. <laughs> For her honesty, she was admitted. There's a lot that is made today about being a leader. We have a culture that is obsessed with being a leader, being unique, standing out, having people follow you. I'm not on Instagram or Insta, as the younger generation calls it. Uh, but one of the things in, in social media is you obtain people who follow you, right? You, you obtain people who, they hang on your videos and your words, and uh, they like the stuff that you post, and you become popular. And it has it is, it is even come to the point where it's monetized, so that if you post a cool video on t TikTok or Instagram or YouTube, that video gets likes, and if you get enough likes, you get money. I don't know how much it is, but you get money, right? It, it, for some people, it's a significant source of income. And so, everybody wants to be a leader. And we live in a society where there's a cult of celebrity. Everybody wants to be a celebrity. Everybody wants to follow uh, a celebrity. That's like the ultimate achievement. And um, there are pluses to being a leader. But you have to ask yourself, where you are leading. Jesus says that the blind lead the blind. I once, I might have told you this story at one point a long time ago, but I once went into a swamp with a friend of mine. And it was a florist swamp. I'd never been in a swamp before. It's not for the faint of heart. And uh, we walked in at about 10 a.m. It was winter time. But the day was warm, and I had never been there before, and it had been many years since my friend had been there. And we each had a machete, and we walked into the jungle. 
of Florida. And it wasn't long before we were in, in muck and in uh, uh, water and uh, we're hacking our way through the forest. And uh, I can tell you right now that there's all sorts of things in the swamp that want to eat you. And uh, I'm not from the swamp. I don't even know what dangers there are or how to spot them. And so I stuck very close behind my friend. And he had a pair of snake guards on, if you've ever seen snake guards, where they're, they're high, hard plastic liners for your boots. And they come up, they come up high so that in the, in the event that you encounter a rattlesnake or a water moccasin, that, uh, that the, it, the bite will be harmless because it'll hit the plastic. I had no snake guards. Mm. All right. My friend had snake guards. And I stuck close by him. And we encountered some snakes. And he told me a story about taking a friend of his into the swamp. And he saw a water moccasin ahead and he thought to himself, will my friend notice the water moccasin? Instead of telling his friend that there's a water moccasin, he allowed his friend to walk right past the water moccasin. And then he told him, listen, you don't know what you're doing in here. You better get behind me. <clears throat> and uh, it would have been the height of folly for me to decide in my arrogance that I know better than my friend. Mm. To forge off and be a leader, try and be a leader and make him follow me in that dangerous place. And when we encountered a snake, he was the first to see it. And he was the one who was most protected from it. And uh, I think that there's a real spiritual lesson in that. Amen. Jesus is the one who's wearing the snake guards. And it is our obligation, and it is the height of wisdom for us to follow him. And he has gone through the ground that he wants us to follow. But I think at some points in time, because we are willful, because we think we know better, we end up forging off through the, the jungle ourselves. Amen. And it's a dangerous thing to do. Increasingly, Leadership institutes and businesses are recognizing the benefit of being a follower. Everybody wants to be a leader, everybody's looking for leaders. But how do you get to be a leader? First you have to be a follower. Mm -hmm. That's what an apprenticeship is. What good is an apprenticeship if the person who is learning from the master is not willing to learn? Amen. Is not willing to follow? <clears throat> If they're going to forge on through their ignorance. And that's one of the things about being a parent and having people who have gone before. You know, they say that there's this old saying that, um, um, you know, that parents tell their kids sometimes, kid, move out while you, know, while you still know everything. Uh, because the younger generation, and I, I mean, I, you know, I, I was not, it wasn't too long ago that I was young myself. And, um, you know, I remember thinking that I know better than my parents. And um, after a certain point in time, I came to appreciate the wisdom of my parents. I would come back from my job and I would wake them up in the middle of the night and sit on the bed and I would tell them about my life. And uh, you know, sometimes those talks lasted till two or three in the morning. And my dad would, after I left the room, my dad would look at my mom and say, how long do you think this state will last? Because <laughs> he had to go to work the next morning. So the question is, do you trust him to follow him? Are you following him? Are we following him? There's a lot of people who say that they're following him. There's a lot of churches. There's a lot of Christians. But not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is following him. Really, they're all following themselves. And the day is going to come when Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. You never followed me. Even though that was your profession. So what does it look like to follow Jesus? What does it look like to trust Him? And what does that look like? Diedrich Bonhoeffer, you've heard that name. How many of you know that name? Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was born in 1906. He was executed in 1945 by the Nazis as the regime was collapsing. He was a Lutheran minister, the founding of what was called the Confessing Church. The reason they were confessing is because they were stating biblical Christianity. 
They were saying, this is our confession. Because the Nazi regime had come in, and a lot of Christian denominations had gone over to the Nazis. And they even created new insignias, where they had the cross and the swastika in the middle of the cross. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor in 1933, was the first person in the country to get on the radio and warn about joining the cult of the Führer. And as he was talking about to the German people, warning them about the danger of slipping into this cult where you made one leader, the supreme leader, and, and could be led astray, he was cut off in mid-sentence, and the broadcast ended. And Bonhoeffer was the first to raise a voice against the persecution of the Jews, at great personal cost to himself. Because despite the fact that everybody knew, or most people knew internally, and from scriptures, that what was going on in Germany was wrong, Amen. nobody said anything. Nobody said anything. And so there was a few people left who would say, who, were, who would stand up and say, and they became targets. Bonhoeffer spent the last year and a half or two years of his life in concentration camps. And um, he was associated with a plot to assassinate Hitler. I don't know if he actually was thinking about that or if he wasn't because he was a pacifist. Um, but at any rate, there was a, a very quick trial and he was condemned to hang. And they marched him and his, uh, his, uh, some of the other condemned people out into the square naked, and they hung them. And, um, you know, but Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And I'm going to read you a couple of quotes. <clears throat> Jesus invites all those that labor and are heavy laden. And nothing could be so contrary to our best intentions and so fatal to our proclamation as to drive men away from him by forcing upon them man-made dogmas. If we do so, we should make the love of Jesus Christ a laughing stock to Christians and pagans alike. So Bonhoeffer is saying that Instead of going to the scriptures and asking people to follow the scriptures and showing them the way to Christ, what sometimes happens in Christianity is that the church begins to promote and espouse strongly held opinions that are held by um, maybe the majority. And that th then those become imposed on the populace. And Bonhoeffer is saying that when you do that, you make a ridicule of Christianity. Because you are, you are erecting, you are elevating a man-made standard. <coughs> not the standard of Christ. Not the standard of the divine. I'll read you one more quote. Is it the church's concern to erect a spiritual tyranny over men by dictating to them what must be believed and performed in order to be saved? And by presuming to enforce that belief and behavior with the sanctions of temporal and eternal punishment, shall the word of the church bring new tyranny and oppression over the souls of men. It may well be that this is what many people want. But could the church consent to meet such a demand? I want you to just, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I want you to think about this, these two statements in the context of following Christ. Because the question of whether or not we are actually following Christ is one which is just as much the possibility of self-deception as any other question. And I want, to, I want you to think about it in the context of church support for lockdowns and for forcing people to have an experimental injection that they don't want personally. When the churches come together and they begin to promote 
and force an agenda that there is no scriptural authority for. That brings Christianity into disrepute. Amen. Amen. The question is, is are we following? Only 20% of the, of the churches in Germany supported uh, the positions of the confessing church. 20%. In fact, some of the churches use Romans chapter 13 to say that people ought to go along with the Third Reich because God ordained the civil authorities. Have you heard that argument before in today's context? Now, I am... Um, I once took a, a young man uh, in a group of young people hiking in the mountains. My wife, some other church members, and um, these were very rugged mountains. And there were bears and cougars, and it was an hour and a half drive out into the middle of nowhere, and you go up through this rocky, not well-defined trail up into the Alpine, and then the trail just sort of disappears. We were looking for a cave called Fang Cave that is pretty famous. And there's no gate on it, but it's up high in the Alpine and it's very difficult to find. And there was a lot of mosquitoes. And this young man who accompanied us, he um, was about 19 or 20 years old, and he was a really troubled youth. And uh, I had told him in advance I'd love to have his company. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that he would stay with the group. This is my recollection, at least. Um, that, that there, there's there's going to be mosquitoes, it's going to be hard, um, but it's going to be fun. And we got up into the Alpine, and this young man pulled me aside and he said, I'm finished with this. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not following, I'm not hiking, I'm done with it. I want to go back to the car. And I said, well, there's 11 other people here, and I'm leading this group and I can't take you back to the car. I said, you have to keep coming with us. And he said, well, I'm not. And I said, well, you're putting me in a very difficult position um, because uh, this group is here, they don't know where they're going, and they're relying on me to continue. And so you're, you're asking me to stop leading this trip. And he said, I'm going, I want to go back to the car. And I said, well, I can tell you right now, it's very selfish of you, and it's also dangerous of you, because if you go by yourself, there's bears, there's cougars, and, um, you know, what the safest thing for you to do would be to keep coming with us. You know, it's going to be fun, we're going to find the cave, it's going to be interesting. But he wouldn't have it. And um, I had to choose, but whether or not I was going to go back to the car. Most of you were probably expecting me to say I went back to the car. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I thought that this guy would say, you know what, after about 10 minutes, like, I recognize that I'm hopelessly lost here and that I need to catch up with the group. So, you know, up into the Alpine we went and I looked back and, um, you know, uh, he didn't follow. And he was an adult and he made a decision to go off into the forest by himself and he promptly got lost. And when we finally found him and met back up with him, he was furious at me. He was furious at me because I had not taken him back to the club. You know, I'm not sure that I made the right decision that day. Um, you know, I, had, I was forced to choose between going with the group and, uh, and making sure that the expedition continued or allowing somebody's free will uh, to go and do what they wanted to do. Um, and he had a very difficult time going through the forest on his own terrified because there are grizzly bears there and there are cougars and wolverines and all sorts of wolves and uh, every creek in the forest made him nervous and scared and um, he glared at me very angrily when we got back to the car and um, but the point of the matter is ir irrespective of whether or not I made the right leadership decision the point is is that going off on your own is a supremely dangerous thing, especially in the context of where we are in this earth's history. Amen. And only you know how closely you're following Jesus Christ. And only I know how, how closely I'm following Jesus Christ. 
Jesus once called twelve apostles. And he said to them, follow me. They were rough. They were backwards. They had been tax collectors and fishermen. But over the course of three and a half years, they became different people. Because you cannot be in contact with the great master of the universe and not be changed. Amen. And so, when they began to testify after the crucifixion and Jesus had ascended into the heavens, and they testified with boldness, Acts chapter 4 says, everybody took note that they had been with Jesus. You can't fake it. You can't fake it. Either you're with him or you're not. And right now, in this earth's history, we are increasingly in a swamp where there are snakes and alligators and dangers all around. And the great tempter is playing a game for your and my soul. And are we following the person with the snake boots on? Or are we off part of the time mucking around in the swamp by ourselves? Only you can answer that question. And if you are not following Jesus today, it is not too late to follow him. Amen. It is not too late to follow him. Amen. Now you're thinking to yourself, maybe, what does any of this have to do with the scripture reading? I'll tell you this. Now turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 18. Luke chapter 18. Verse 38 is our scripture reading. We're going to pick it up at verse 35. Jesus is walking and he is going to Jerusalem. And on his way to Jerusalem, he is passing by Jericho. He is going to Jerusalem for what purpose? He's going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be crucified for our sakes. But he comes by Jericho, and there was, verse 35 says, a certain blind man sitting by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. I just want you to think about this blind man for a moment. None of us here in this room, I don't think, are blind. We have the inestimable advantage of sight. But this man was blind, and he had been blind for many, many years, and he had sat begging by the wayside. And his senses were heightened, and he heard something out of the ordinary. He heard a great multitude. And so he began to ask the passers-by, what does this mean? Who, what's going on? And they said to him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And what you're hearing is the people who are following him. And this blind man began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And those who went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. Be quiet. Be quiet. But he cried more, much more, Thou Son of David, have mercy on me. This man confessed his faith that Jesus was the Messiah, because the Messiah was known by the name Son of David. Amen. And in his blindness, he recognized an opportunity. The one opportunity that he had. And so he began to cry aloud, and it did not matter to him how much people told him to be quiet. He refused to be quiet Amen. until the object of his heart was granted. And the amazing thing is, is that the God of the universe, who was walking to his crucifixion, stopped what he was doing in response to this blind beggar. And the uh, verse 40 says, Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, 
What will do you will, that I should do unto you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Amen. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. There's a couple things I just want to draw your attention to in closing with respect to this story. The first is this. Jesus Christ is passing by right now. The day of salvation is right now. And if you're not following Jesus completely, today is the day where you can decide to change that. If there is some sin, if there is some distraction in your life where you know in your heart the Holy Spirit has said to you, this is separating you from me. Today is the day that you can say, I'm going to follow Jesus with all my heart. And this blind man refused to, to give up on this opportunity. He could have allowed people to say to him, be quiet and stop talking. He could have been embarrassed. But he never would have achieved what happened next if he had stopped. And so we are to call to Jesus ourselves. Jesus, does, Jesus put himself in this circumstance. He wants, to be, he wants to meet the blind man. He has brought himself in close proximity with this man. He has brought himself in close proximity with us today. The last thing that I want to say today is this. If you look at verse 36, you'll see that what alerted the blind man, this blind beggar sitting by the wayside, what alerted him to the fact that his Savior and his Redeemer was passing by was the sound of the multitude. And if you go in Revelation chapter 14, you will see a description of the last group that goes out to get the last harvest on this earth. Revelation 13 is about the two beasts and all the world following after the beast. And then you see God's response to this global deception. And you see a lamb standing on the mount, Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women. Meaning the other churches. The woman is a symbol of the church. These are those who are not defiled with the doctrines of false churches. For they are virgins. These are those.